Father Brown himself is here somewhere. Father Brown. Oh, Father Brown, please come up. Take the podium, Father. We're very happy to have you. Father Brown. I seem to be in the wrong location. Uh, <laughs> so I, I, I do apologize. But since I'm here, and, uh, you are all talking about um, detective stories, right? Yeah. In fact, I heard some of the talks earlier. They're really quite good. Um, um, but, you know, I think there's some things that need to be corrected about what some of your speakers said. And so, with all, you know, appropriate humility, I suppose I can, I can give that a shot. The other thing I would like to do is, if you had Dr. Watson um, record in all of Sherlock uh, Holmes' mysteries, and Watson was his accompanist, his, his, his amnesis, we might say, his associate. G.K. Chesterton did that, did that for me, you know. He didn't really physically accompany me on my, on my adventures, but uh, he was able to put some of them into writing. And so what I thought I could do, since this is a conference on, on mystery, is, um, and perhaps I could take you through one of the mystery stories that uh, Chesterton wrote. Now, I think there's talk about uh, if you reveal the solution to a mystery, you will go straight to hell. And, well, of course, you know, I'm pre vatican too. <laughs> we still have hell in our world. So it's possible. But you, you do have you do have a dispensation because when you when you recount a mystery, and I have one here that I'll take you through that Mr. Chesterton wrote about me, well then you can reveal the solution at the end. And I think we'll do so later in the little performance that you'll see. But as I was saying, there are some um, notes that I managed to make. I thought it was very interesting when Mr. Alquist said, uh, quoting Chesterton, that the supernatural has to be ruled out of any mystery. Well, why do you suppose that would be? You, know, you have here, uh, I believe in America, um, um, something called uh, um, Scooby-Doo. <laughs> now, in, in the, in the Scooby-Doo mysteries, the, the typical pattern from what I gather is that, uh, well, the suspect is a ghost or a goblin, something preternatural or supernatural, and invariably, at the end of every show, it's shown to be a human being in disguise. But why would it be that even children who watch the cartoon would be dissatisfied if the guilty party was somehow a ghost, a goblin, an elf, something from the other realm? Why do you suppose that is? Really, I'm asking a question. Why do you suppose the supernatural has to be eliminated from any detective story. Any ideas? It's not solvable. Well, it's not solvable. Yes, yes, sir. No rational explanation would be like a deus ex machina. A deus ex machina, no rational explanation would seem to come from nowhere, and that from the mouth of a professional magician. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Because you want the reader to be in the same plane as the other characters. Well, yes, I would think that that's certainly part of it. I think all of those are very good answers. And in addition to that, there are a few things that perhaps I can use to help illuminate. Um, uh, 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 this is what Chesterton wrote. I pointed out to him, someone he's arguing with, that this was not an attitude we adopt specially toward impossible marvels, but simply the attitude we adopt towards all unusual occurrences. If we were certain of miracles, we should not count on them. Things that happen very seldom, we leave out of our calculations, whether they are miraculous or not. And I suppose you're right, it would seem cheap if the solution to a mystery would be something so extraordinary that there would be no way for the reader really to buy into it, even though the supernatural is quite real. But in a way, the stories that Chesterton wrote about me combine the supernatural and the natural. There are never any supernatural explanations completely for the, let's say, clues, the solution on the level of the clues. But there's a deeper solution and a deeper mystery in Chesterton's detective fiction, and those solutions do operate at a supernatural or a spiritual level, and I'll give you an example of that in a moment. Speaking of which, though, there's a huge mystery in Scripture. Think 
about things. If you've read the book of Genesis, there's a character named Melchizedek who appears to Abram, Abraham. Melchizedek comes and Abram has been victorious. Melchizedek is described as the king of Salem, which apparently means Jerusalem, a city which was later to figure prominently in the history of our faith. And this mysterious king who shows up out of nowhere is described as the king of righteousness, a priest of the Most High God. But well, there's, there's only one Most High God. There can only be one Most High anything. And this priest mysteriously appears with bread and wine in what I believe is the 14th chapter of Genesis. Bread and wine? A priest bringing bread and wine and receiving tithes from the father of the Jewish people, the father of the chosen people. How strange that is. And then later in the book of Joshua, there's Adonai Zedek. He's mentioned as the king of Jerusalem, which also means uh, um, of the Most High God, priest of the Most High God. Because in a sense, David, who becomes the king of Jerusalem, the king of Israel, he also functions as a priest, as do we all, uh, king, priest, uh, prophet, and so forth. But there's also the psalm. You are a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. Now, meanwhile, in the Old Testament, you have the Levitical priesthood that is explained in the Law of Moses and it's explained in details. So there's only two mentions of Melchizedek in all of the Old Testament, one of Ananias and them. And that's it. It's left as well as a mystery. What on earth is this priest of the Most High God who appears with bread and wine? at the beginning of the story of salvation. Well, it takes 2,000 years for this mystery to be solved. The author of the book of Hebrews, which is perhaps St. Paul, goes on at length in the New Testament about how Melchizedek is an order of the priesthood predating the Levitical order. He is a priest forever after the Most High God, and of course, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is himself priest in that order, a priest forever, for he will never die again. And so the solution of this takes 2,000 years. And if, if you don't accept the New Testament, if you're Jewish, if you're a non-believer, you're still stuck with this strange character, like he's a day, which you try to explain away as a literary interpolation or something odd, as many people do. And yet in the story, if you look at salvation history and all of the Bible as a story, it's a huge animal. Well, is it a red herring? Or is it a clue that remains to be solved? But you see, that's, that's how God works in the great mystery that, that he writes. And so I would suggest that there is something spiritual, at least, in the mysteries of G.K. Chesterton, even though the solutions are not cheap and magical. Oh, by the way, something was said about Sherlock Holmes earlier, and as you know, um, Chesterton um, sort of came up with his um, character as a, as a sort of an anti-Holmes, or a, sort of a, a not the super But if you read Sherlock Holmes closely, and, and Dupin, who's the detective in, in Edgar Allan Poe's mysteries, which were written 50 years as a rule before most of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's, you will find there are clues that they're not really detectives who solve the mysteries merely by their superpowers of observation, which they do, but they're more than mere scientists. They're more than mere materialists. For instance, there are many times when Holmes or Dupin will criticize the police, the official detectives, and the police are unable to arrive at a true solution. Why? The explanation is generally they're, they're not imaginative enough. They don't think outside the box, you might say. And so, you see, I do think there's even in those characters something that points to, well, points to Father Brown. Not to be egotistical, but I do think there's something indicating that even the earlier writers of detective fiction knew that there was more to this genre than many brilliant scientific minds. In the mid-19th century, when these stories began to be written, was an, uh, the high watermark of confidence in materialism and in science's enlightened ability to solve anything. And yet, over and 
and over again, Holmes is criticizing the ordinary detectives who don't have imagination. He doesn't always use that word, but that's what he means. If you merely are stuck with what's right in front of your face, you can never see the whole picture. If you think that when you're behind the tapestry, that's all there is, and you think that that is the whole tapestry, and you don't use your imagination or your reason to get outside of the tapestry, you never will get close to the solution. And so I would point out that I think that this is a tendency, in, in spite of Scooby-Doo, that does, in fact, work its way through detective uh, fiction. And the other thing is, human nature is a mystery. And really, if you think about the way I solve my cases, it has as much to do with the knowledge of human nature as with the details that I happen to observe. Before I get into my mystery story, which I wanted to convey to you, written marvelously by G.K. Chesterton, I mean, he's a much better writer than Dr. Watson, I must say. And whatever, but he is, too, that's simply, that's simply observable. Um, the, 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 this, is, this is a theory of detective fiction by W.H. Orton, who is a, a, a poet of, of some renown. I wanted to quote you some of the things he says. We'll see if you agree with them. And then I'll apply them to the story that I'm going to relay to you. Uh, he begins by admitting that he's an addict to detective fiction. And yet he says something interesting to me. Well, first of all, I'll read most of his first paragraph. He says, for me, as for many others, the reading of detective stories is an addiction like tobacco or alcohol. The uh, symptoms of this are, firstly, the intensity of the craving. If I have any work to do, I must be careful not to get hold of a detective story, for once I begin one, I cannot sleep till I have finished it. Secondly, it's specificity. The story must conform to certain formulas. I find it very difficult, for example, to read one that is not set in a rural England. <laughs> and thirdly, it's immediacy. I forget the story as soon as I've finished it, and have no wish to read it again. If, as sometimes happens, I start reading one and find after a few pages that I have read it before, I cannot go on. However, I read these uh, mysteries that uh, Chesterton writes about me, and let me tell you something. They're, they're even more interesting the third or fourth time. <laughs> Orton is certainly wrong when it comes to Chesterton's mysteries. Uh, he then says he's going to look into um, detective fiction in this little article, and he says, I, I may throw some light not only on their function, but on the function of art, because he says, um, such reactions convince me, in my case at least, detective stories have nothing to do with works of art. In other words, they're games or gimmicks, and he does go on to imply that they satisfy deep desires of justice and righteousness in us. But do they really have nothing to do with works of art? Well, I think the story I'm going to convey will indicate that, in fact, they do. It's a very artistic story, over and above the puzzle that is presented and solved. I will give Auden credit. He uses Aristotle and the patterns of tragedy to analyze detective stories. He says, first, there is a peaceful state before the murder. And he says, the murders are better if they do take place in rural England or in a closed society where there's only a few people. Um, and it seems as if they're, they're in a kind of an Eden. But it's a false innocence. And the false innocence is revealed when the murder occurs. And at that point, then there are clues, there's an investigation, there might be a secondary murder, and the reader and sometimes the detective in the story have a false location of guilt. There's one or more false suspects. And what everyone desires is for the guilt to be placed upon the guilty party. This really is, you know, you know I, since I've come to America, yeah, and not only do I watch Scooby-Doo, I watch Judge Judy. <laughs> and Judge Judy points out that if someone is suing someone else, or, you know, and then they say, no, I didn't do it. It was not my dog that attacked your dog. I'm not the one who pushed you down. Judge Judy says, well, why would, why would they accuse someone falsely? The deep desire is to find the person who harmed you, that justice may be done. 
If you think about that, that's really quite true. And it's true for mystery stories. If a mystery story ended with a, someone convicted of the crime who was not guilty, why, we would tear the book up and throw it away. That would be a mystery I would never read again myself. There is then the solution, the location of the real guilt and the arrest of the murderer, which Auden says is the catharsis, which restores true innocence to the society that was falsely innocent but harboring guilty pleasures or desires before the murder. He also says one other thing before I get into my story. He says, completely satisfactory detectives are extremely rare Indeed, I only know of three. Sherlock Holmes by Arthur Conan Doyle, Inspector French by Freeman Wills Crofts, and Father Brown by G.K. Chesterton. And he talks a bit about why he thinks they are the perfect detectives. Holmes is the exceptional individual who, in a state, who is in a state of grace because he is a genius in whom scientific curiosity is raised to the status of a heroic passion. He is erudite, but his knowledge is absolutely specialized. He is, in all matters outside the field, as helpless as a child, for example, his untidiness. And he pays the price for his scientific detachment, his neglect of feeling, by being the victim of melancholia, which attacks him whenever he is unoccupied with a case, for example, his violin playing and cocaine taking. He thinks that this detective in these stories needs to be... Um, <laughs> They need to be unassailable. They cannot have a vested interest in any of the characters. And it's better, he says, that they're amateur detectives, because then they're not even being paid to solve the case. Or perhaps they are, but they're not professional police officers. He's, he's saying that you need to be distant. And in one place, he says, it's, it's even better that the detective is unmarried. Of which, of course, I'm a very good example of that. <laughs> he talks about he talks about the French, the detective uh, Inspector French, and, um, and then, then he talks about Father Brown. He says, like Holmes, Brown is an amateur, yet like French, not an individual genius. His activities as a detective are an incidental part of his activities as a priest who cares for souls. Well, that's quite true, <laughs> obviously. His prime motive is compassion, of which the guilty are in greater need than the innocent. And he investigates murders not for his own sake, nor even for the sake of the innocent, but for the sake of the murderer, who can save his soul if he will confess and repent. He solves his cases not by approaching them objectively like a scientist or a policeman, but by subjectively imagining himself to be the murderer. And I think he's stretching it a bit there, but I do think what he's saying is a certain empathy is going on. It's not merely scientific analysis from the outside, but as I say, I think the same is true for Sherlock Holmes, really. Uh, Holmes and French can only help the murderer as teachers, i.e., they can teach him that murder will out and does, does not pay. More they cannot do, since neither is tempted to murder. Holmes is too gifted French, too well-trained in the habit of virtue. Father Brown can go further and help the murderer as an example, i.e. as a man who is also tempted to murder, but is able by faith to resist temptation. I think there's much to be said for that. Oh, there was another quote that Mr. Alders... Mr. Alders' speech was amazing, wasn't it? Um, and then there was Joseph Pierce's speech. <laughs> One of the things that Mr. Orbelist quoted was from one of the mystery stories of Father Brown. People will tell you, I say in that story, that theories don't matter and that logic and philosophy aren't practical. Don't you believe them? Reason is from God. And when things are unreasonable, there is something that matter. Now, I don't know how many of you, and the other thing that I watch, I watch Scooby-Doo, I watch Judge Judy, and every now and then I watch this fellow, Dr. Phil. And it's really fascinating to me, the culture that you have here, or, or lack thereof, I'm not quite sure which it is. But you see, you have this phrase, dysfunctional family. Often, you don't know you're in a dysfunctional family until you, until you get out of it, you know? When, which 
you get out of it, you're on the other side of the tapestry. And you can look back and you, you, you can say, I knew something was wrong. I felt it in my bones. There was something irrational here, something disordered in the way we were living. There was either a secret that everyone was keeping, an elephant in the living room that no one could acknowledge, or what have you. But I knew there was a problem, and then you see it, and you say, aha. You see, that moment, aha, which happens in the mystery, that great moment of revelation, enlightenment, and awe, which only reason is capable of, reason which includes the imagination, you see? Now that, that is something that I think relates to this story that I'm going to take you through. Oh, by the way, we do have this. Is it, the other thing you do here in America is you're always selling things. This is, this is, uh, it was mentioned earlier by that fellow who did that ridiculous thing. And then this, this is the movie based on the honor of Israel Gao, one of Chesterton's stories. And in this movie, we're at Glengyle Castle. And I, I say, we're trying to figure out, has there been a murder? Who is the murderer? What is the mystery? And I say at one point, um, I say, 10 false philosophies will fit the universe. 10 false theories will fit Glengyle Castle. But we want the real explanation of Glengyle Castle and the universe. Because you see, it is quite possible to string together a series of things, as I do in this story without giving away the ending. And that is, I, I come up with four or five false solutions in that story. All but one, I'm doing as a joke, I'm trying to just sort of have fun. Coming up with ways that the clues can fit together that make sense, but that are just wild guesses and probably not true. And then, and then ironically, I, I come up with a solution in that, which is another false solution, but I don't know it myself until we get to the very end. But you see, this is what life is like. As we grow older, and we have more private revelations, you might say, more experience, more grace from God, and we test our theories of the universe and our own private castles, then that's when we do find out that well, perhaps, perhaps I was wrong when I thought the killer was crazy about the French Revolution. Perhaps I was wrong when I thought that he was, he was uh, merely a, a, a miner who, who had all these clues to help him steal jewels. Uh, and perhaps there's a better solution where you really can say, ah, that's it. Now in this story, which is uh, the wrong shape, there is something wrong. You know, in, in, in the quote from the Red Moon of Maru, when things are unreasonable, there is something the matter. Well, in this story, there are some very unreasonable things, including the wrong shape of some of the clues, including the wrong shape of the philosophy of some of the characters. And this is why Chesterton's mystery stories are far deeper and are certainly works of art, because they're not just about puzzles. They're not just pastimes. They are that, and they're very good at that. But on a deeper level, they're about the difference between the right shape and the wrong shape, between what is properly ordered and what is disordinate or disordered. In this story, the flambeau and I are um, at a house where there's a man named Quint who is, uh, oh, he's into opium and he's into Eastern religions and he's, uh, oh, he's, he's, he's a poet, of course, which means he does nothing but lay around all day. And, and, and Quentin is, um, I would say, morbid. You know, he takes a few too many of these drugs to achieve a kind of an artificial nirvana. Well, nirvana itself, of course, is something I would disagree with, but he's seeking a nirvana. By the way, do you know what nirvana is? In, in the Buddhist uh, conception, uh, Hindu and so forth, do, do you know what, what, what really Buddhism desires, so to speak, if you use the word desire um, with a certain amount of care? Well, what is the heaven? the Buddhist, do you know? It's very different from the heaven of the Christian, yes ma'am? Um, it's the freedom from all desire. The freedom from all desire. Oh yes, Ted. It's oblivion. Oblivion. It's oblivion. It's ceasing to be. Not only do you have no desire, since all living things desire something, the only way out of this terrible circle of desire, uh, partial satisfaction and eventual frustration and more desire, is to stop existing. 
Oblivion. That's what the Buddhist wants. That's nirvana. And that's, of course, if you take certain drugs, you can come close to that. Of course, you'll desire more and more drugs. Well, Quentin, who becomes the victim, is one of those characters. He's married, his wife is a very wonderful woman, and there's a doctor in the story, Dr. Harris. And if I read parts of it, I'll probably change my voice and do him with an American accent. Because you see, even though Dr. Harris is not necessarily American, he's the super skeptic of the story. He's completely materialistic and he's completely suspicious of anything spiritual or supernatural or religious in any way. There's another suspect, which is a drug addict who keeps trying to get into Quentin. And this is a locked room of mystery, by the way. And so Quentin, uh, oh, there's one final suspect. I can't pass him up. Flambeau and the doctor and I run into a fakir, F-A-K-I-R, or you might say faker, F-A-K-E-R. He is a guru. Quentin, being enamored of Eastern religion and philosophy, keeps his own personal guru. And um, here we are. I want to read to you how this goes. Uh, here we go. Well, we come upon him. And one of the characters says, um, Oh, we find, we find a knife that's of an odd shape. It seems to be the wrong shape in the garden. And then we see this Indian faker, and we question him, or at least Flambeau does, as soon as I can find it, which is in here somewhere. And you have to excuse me, I'm not really the most organized of people. And um, here we are. And so we come upon this Hindu, this Easterner, and Flambeau approaches him and says, good evening, sir, do you want anything? Quite slowly, like a great ship turning into a harbor, the great yellow face turned and looked at last over its white shoulder. They were startled to see that its yellow eyelids were quite sealed, as in sleep. Thank you, said the face in excellent English. I want nothing. Then, half opening the lids so as to show a slit of opalescent eyeball, he repeated, I want nothing. Then he opened his eyes with a startling stare and said, I want nothing, and went rustling away into the rapidly darkening garden. The Christian is more modest, muttered Father Brown. He wants something. One of the Psalms says that our Lord fulfills our heart's desire. Our faith teaches that desire is not wrong. Like creation it is good, though in our case has fallen men and women, it is disproportionate. And we have to keep our desires in check and in focus. But desire itself is good because our desires are totally fulfilled and there will come a time when every tear will be wiped away. And so this character, the Hindu, the guru, is a suspect. We have the doctor, and we have the wife, we have the drug addict who keeps trying to get into Quentin to borrow money to buy more drugs, and we have the guru. Now here we have an example of a story that appears a supernatural solution. Because while we're all outside and a storm is gathering, by the way, if you read these Father Brown stories, it's what Joseph Pierce said about the man who was Thursday. You see, there always comes a time in pretty much every story where there's a feeling of darkness, nihilism, and terror, often symbolized by nature. In this particular story, clouds roll in, a storm is coming, it starts to rain. And it looks very bleak and very dark. There's one story where Flambeau and I are walking through the woods. And as I'm relaying a mystery that I've solved, when we get to the point where there seems to be no solution, we feel as if we're lost and the woods are at their darkest. And then when the solution begins to dawn, we can see a path ahead of us. 
These stories are miniature versions of the Man of Thursday, really. These stories are about coming through that darkness, coming through what Chesterton did when he was at the Slade Art School, coming through that depression and despondency, the feeling that nothing fits together, there can be no solution. Or if there is one, it's demonic. But in this case, while we're outside and the storm, storm gathers, and we found this strange knife that was lying in the grass, which was of the wrong shape. And I mentioned how even the art, even Eastern art, can sometimes somehow be wrong. A wrong shape, a wrong thing. And in the middle of this, the doctor, who has given Quentin uh, some sleeping medication, runs up to us and says, it looks like he's more than asleep in this locked room that we can see through a window, through a glass. We rush in, the doctor goes first, he rushes up to Quentin, and then he calls us in. He says it's too late. And we find on the table a note that says, Though I die by my own hand, I die murdered. And yet the note is of an odd shape. There's a, uh, the, what, the, the top corner has been clipped off. And we notice that he did this with all his pieces of paper. He would clip off the top corner of a perverse act of deliberately making something the wrong shape. And we also notice that he's been stabbed by the strange knife of the wrong shape, which the last we recall seeing it was lying in the grass in the garden. And all we notice is the guru standing and staring in the window at the victim. And the obvious but cheap solution would be, well, he does in fact have magic. He was able to transport the knife from outside to inside into the victim's heart. And the victim somehow knew it was coming and wrote a note predicting it. But of course, as in Scooby-Doo, the killer is never really magical. But I do say a little bit more about the guru. When the Indian spoke to us, went on Brown in a conversational undertone. I had a sort of vision, a vision of him and all his universe. Yet he only said the same thing three times. When first he said, I want nothing, it meant only that he was impenetrable. That Asia does not give itself away. I am a mystery. I want nothing. Then he said, I want nothing. And I knew that he meant that he was sufficient to himself like a cosmos, that he needed no God, neither admitted any sin. How horrible we would be if we really wanted nothing. If we really obtained nirvana on earth and could walk around with no desires, we would be entirely self-sufficient and full of pride. The fact that we need basic things like air and food and miraculous things like love and understanding proves that we should be humble. And I believe, as uh, Aristotle points out, if you had everything you needed and wanted in the way of food and money and shelter, but had no friendship or no love, well, you would be miserable. You don't need love to live, do you? Well, you need love to live, to live properly. But then I go on and I say, and when he said the third time, I want nothing. He said it with blazing eyes, and I knew that he meant literally what he said. That nothing was his desire in his home. That he was weary for nothing as for wine. That annihilation or obliteration, the mere destruction of everything or anything, is what he desired. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the wrong shape for a philosophy. It solves the problem of desire and frustration, but it solves it in the wrong way. It's one of the ten false philosophies of the universe. It's actually a million. And it does not explain either the universe or Glengyle Castle or this particular mystery. I will tell you that, and I'll give this away, because I, I'm going to risk hell, as I say, but I'm giving it away because I'm sort of doing a dramatic presentation, and you would all be frustrated if I didn't give it away. At one point, I asked the doctor, 
to go right out to me in explanation of the mystery and I suggest to him that he knows more than he's telling. I will read you the doctor's note that he gave to me. Vichisti Galilee, meaning you have won, Galilean. You have won, representative of the man from Galilee. Otherwise, damn your eyes, which are very penetrating ones. Can it be possible that there is something in all that stuff of yours after all? I am a man who has ever since boyhood believed in nature and in all natural functions and instincts, whether man called them moral or immoral. Long before I became a doctor, when I was a schoolboy keeping mice and spiders, I believed that to be a good animal is to be the best thing in the world. Survival of the fittest. Might makes right. But just now, I am shaken. I have believed in nature, but it seems as if nature could betray a man. Can there be anything in your bosh? I loved Quentin's wife. And what was there wrong in that? It's natural. Nature told me to. And it's love that makes the world go round. I also thought quite sincerely that she would be happier with a clean animal like me than that tormenting little drug-addicted lunatic. What was there wrong in that? You see, he's somewhat defensive. I was only facing facts like a man of science. She would have been happier. According to my own creed, I was quite free to kill Quentin, which was the best thing for everybody, including her himself. But as a healthy animal, I had no notion of killing myself. I resolved, therefore, that I would never do it until I saw a chance that would leave me scot-free. I saw that chance this morning. I have been three times all told into Quentin's study today. The first time I went in, he would talk about nothing but the weird tale called The Cure of a Saint, which he was writing, which was all about how some Indian hermit made an English colonel kill himself by thinking about him. He showed me the last sheets and even read me the last paragraph, which was something like this. The conqueror of the Punjab, a mere yellow skeleton but still gigantic, managed to lift himself on his elbow and gasp in his nephew's ear, quote, I die by my own hand, yet I die murdered. And then he goes on to explain that he, he took that piece of paper and he snipped off the quotation mark so that no one would suspect that it was a scene from a fiction. And we would think it was made of a suicide note of Quentin himself, it was clearly in his handwriting. And then he snipped off the corners of all the other papers, you see? to make us think that the wrong shape was the right solution. And he then says that he pocketed the knife of the wrong shape, pretended to be concerned about Quentin while outside the room, rushed in ahead of us into the locked room, while he was in there quite quickly, took the knife he had pocketed and stabbed him to death. He didn't yell out because he's already given him his drugs, his sleeping drugs. And he talks about the fact that he was able to put the knife in in just the right way, in spite of the right shape, because he is a trained surgeon. And he says, I wonder if you noticed that. Well, he continues. When I had done it, the extraordinary thing happened. Nature deserted me. I felt ill. I felt just as if I had done something wrong. I think my brain is breaking up. I feel some sort of desperate pleasure in thinking I have told the thing to somebody, that I shall not have to be alone with it if I marry and have children. What is the matter with me, madness? Or can one have remorse, just as if one were in Byron's poems? I cannot write any more. James Erskine Harris. And I told him he could write to me in total confidence, and so I didn't even tell Flambeau of the contents of the letter. It was, after all, a confession. And then the police show up. But at that point, my job was done, you see. The murderer is not necessarily convicted, but perhaps in this case, he is acquitted, or at least on the road to being acquitted, because 
the soul of the murderer is more important than the solution to the mystery. But don't you see? He had the wrong shape. He had the wrong shape in his head. He believed that desire was natural, and untrammeled desire was justifiable. In fact, he believed there was no such thing as justifiable or not. That if you felt something naturally, if you had a desire, a natural desire, you simply act on it, and you satisfy it. And yet, strangely, even when people do that, and we all do that at one point or another in our lives, probably over and over again, we learn that it doesn't really satisfy us. Isn't that strange? Well, if the Indian faith, if the guru thought the right solution to life, the wrong shape he had in his mind, was eliminate desire. Desire, nothing. Desire, obliteration and annihilation. The doctor was in a sense the opposite. He said the meaning of life, his wrong shape, was act on all your desires. And if you are strong enough and smart enough, you'll get them. And yet he was surprised that once he had killed the man, he felt something that was actually remorse. Well, that's a work of art, that story. That's not just a game. W.H. Auden has a lot of insights into detective fiction, but that one was the wrong shape. Because these stories, at least the ones written by uh, my friend G.K. Chesterton, are indeed works of art. Because, after all, they bring us closer to the truth. As Mr. Alquist said, the truth will set you free. As someone far greater than Mr. Alquist said, the truth will set you free. And these stories are about finding the deep and sometimes hidden truth. Thank you very much.